Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Lanern of Keene State College, and I'm going to be talking to you in a series of online lectures um, about the topic Making Sense of Genomic Data, Gene Calling, and Genome Annotation. The goals for this short series of lectures are to define the topics of gene calling within the context of genome annotation, talk about why it's important, what the basic question is, and ultimately talk about how we answer this question informatically. And this is meant to be an overview of the topic. We're going to have to discuss some background concepts that you need in order to understand the topic, such as how sequence data is shared and communicated, what some of those conventions are, gene structure within prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and the concept of reading frames. Then we're going to talk about the idea of an open reading frame, or an ORF, and how you move beyond finding ORFs into actually calling a gene or identifying a gene. Um, at the end of this series of lectures, you will be completing an assignment to practice finding ORFs using some common online tools. So let's talk about the scope of genomic data and why gene calling and genome annotation are important as the first focus of this lecture series. First of all, just how much genome data exists? And how does the cost, or how has the cost, of DNA sequencing um, affected the amount of genome data? So here is a graph or figure that is posted at the website indicated in the figure. It's produced by the NIH, specifically by their um, Human Genome uh, Project information or research site. And it shows um, time across the bottom axis and cost per genome, and that's focused in on the human genome, which is about 3 billion base pairs in size, or 3 gigabase pairs in size, or 3,000 megabase pairs in size. And this green line shows actual data up until the year 2015. It's not been updated more recently than that. And what it shows is that the initial cost um, per genome was around 100 million. Um, that, that includes just strictly sequencing costs. The actual total cost of getting that first human genome, which was completed in draft form in 2001, and in what is considered the finished form in 2003, was actually um, around $3 billion. Um, that includes like all the labor and publishing costs and so on. But the sequencing costs were about $100 million. And so, from 2001, when that um, draft genome came out, up until 2008, what we saw is a pattern of sequencing costs declining, and it declined in correlation with the predicted costs or of um, computing power, which is uh, thought to decrease twofold every two years or so, uh, a concept that's described better um, in something called Moore's Law. And then you see this sudden decline in this graph, which happened in the time frame of 2007 to 2008. And what happened there is that we saw a sharp decrease in sequencing, raw sequencing costs, up until 2015, and that's continued to drop today and is actually predicted to continue to drop in, in the foreseeable future. And so what happened in 2007 and 2008 that caused this sudden decline? And what happened is a shift in sequencing technology. So that initial human genome sequence, um, and most sequencing up until 2007, was done with a technology published in 1977 called Sanger sequencing. Um, and it was very manual, very labor intensive. Around 2007, 2008, we made the shift into what are called next generation or second generation sequencing technology. For example, Illumina sequencing, which we'll be learning more about in other areas of this course. Once we got that new sequencing technology, these costs plummeted. And in fact, we're anticipating the Illumina company predicts that we should be able to sequence a human genome for perhaps as low as $100 in raw sequencing costs within the next five to 10 years. Um, so we're really seeing transformative changes in sequencing costs. And what that's done is it's really influenced the amount of sequencing that we've been able to do, not just on humans, but in all organisms. So this data and the sources of the data are shown here and here. This data shows a prediction going up to 2025 for the numbers of prokaryotic, which would include bacteria 
and archaeal organisms and eukaryotic organisms, which include things like humans and also plants and mice and, and yeast, for example. Um, how many sequenced genomes from a cumulative perspective, and this is a logged scale, have we seen up until 2013 and did we expect to see up until 25? And what's interesting and fun about this, and maybe also a bit terrifying, is that you should actually mentally adjust these dashed lines to go up in a, in a steeper fashion. Because what we're seeing is in, to, in 2017, if you look today in the gold resource, which is part of the Joint Genome Institute, um, a genomics um, institute um, and um, site organized by the Department of Energy in the United States, we've already got 241,000 bacterial genomes as of today. And so that number would fall, you know, a little bit higher than what this graph actually shows. So we're seeing a tremendous number of bacterial, archaeal, and eukaryotic, as well as viral genomes that are being published. Now, whether they are in complete finished usable states or draft states, which we'll talk about more later, is a different question. So these are really just approximations, but I really just want you to get a feel for just the vast amount of information that exists in the form of genomic data today. This is the number of human genomes that have been sequenced, and this graph only goes up to 2011, and then it was predicted up from 11 up until 14, um, and this is the source of that data. It was an MIT review paper um, that, that was actually citing a, a Nature paper. But what we know is that in 2014, the Illumina company estimated that there were 228,000 sequenced human genomes that they knew of, probably more that had been sequenced in the private sector that weren't as well documented or as publicly available. So we're heading towards millions very, very rapidly, millions of sequenced human genomes. And some of those are really interesting because while the first human genome projects focused on average data and also data collected from fairly healthy individuals, we're now getting more and more human genomes sequenced from people who have various genetic conditions or other adverse health effects, as well as the super healthy, the high performing elite athletes. We've got sequenced data from a human ancestor collected from bones that are about 430,000 years old, found in a cave in Spain. Um, and we've got, um, we even have a group of scientists who in 2016 revealed a plan to synthesize, make artificial human genomes um, for the purposes of growing tissue and organs to be transplanted in the, in the not so distant future. So I don't know what the limit is on the number of genomes or the kinds of genomes that we can even make, but what all of this is doing is resulting in more and more information that has to be analyzed and understood and applied in order to make the cost of acquiring it worthwhile for humans. So let's think about what this means in terms of information, and let's, let's think about it in computing terms. So let's go from base pairs, which is a unit of information in DNA or in a genome, to bytes. So if we think about that language, a bit represents a binary code, so it's 0 or 1, and there are 8 bits in a byte. A byte is a unit of, of information that can be stored computationally. So let's say we represent base pairs of DNA in binary code, and we do it like this. We say that AT is 00, zero TA is 01, CG is 10, and GC is 11. And that would mean that you would use two bits of data for every one base pair. And since there are eight bits in a byte, you would have one byte and four byte, one byte of computer information representing four base pairs. So if we use that as a conversion factor, right? one byte per four base pairs, and we think that the approximate diploid size of the human genome, so all of the chromosomal content, wherein you have two copies of each of our uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes, that would result, that would, that would entail six times 10 to the nine base pairs, okay, or six gigabase pairs. So I said earlier the human genome was three billion base pairs, but that's the haploid genome, what you would find in sperm or eggs. The six gig gigabase pairs of information is what you would find in any somatic or non-reproductive cell. So if we take that amount of data and we multiply it by our conversion factor, what we see is that the, an average human genome takes up 1.5 times 10 to the 9 
bytes of information, or 1.5 gigabytes, or or in giga, uh, sorry, GB. So that is just plain a lot of data, and that's just one human genome. And I just told you that in 2014, we had well over 200,000 of these genomes sequenced, and that we have literally hundreds of thousands of genomes sequenced from other organisms. Some actually have much bigger genomes than the humans. Many plant species have much bigger genomes than humans. So my point here is that this is one heck of a lot of information. So where do you find all this stuff? And there are, in fact, many answers to that question. So I mentioned the gold resource earlier. The U.S. Department of Energy hosts something called the Joint Genome Institute, or JGI, and it in turn hosts a resource called GOLD, the Genomes Online Database. And that's a World Wide Web resource that gives you comprehensive access to information about genomes and also metagenomes, which would be all the DNA from an, a, a complex environmental sample, and their associated metadata, which would be things like you know, if it was a human sample, it would be like who the human was and what their health conditions were and how old they were and when it was sampled and how it was sequenced and so on. This website will show you that information. What we refer to as GenBank is hosted by the U.S. National Center for Biotechnology Information, or the NCBI, and it has a subsite called NCBI Genome found here. You can find a ton of genome data there. There's an equivalent site in Europe, the European Bioinformatics Institute, and others globally located, such as the National Institute of Genetics in Japan, there's a Swiss Institute, there's one in the UK, and then there's an institute called Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in the US. These are just a few of the places that host genome data. So luckily, all of these agencies work together and they share data. So if there's a new genome sequence um, discovered or obtained by Japanese scientists, they'll upload it to the National Institute of Genetics in Japan, and then within 24 hours, that information will be pushed across all of these other platforms so that we can all access that data. It's a public, common resource, part of the commonwealth of science. So what we're going to talk about next is what we do with all this data. How do we, how do we not be like overwhelmed by these gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of information? And this is really where people like you come in. We need innovative clever people who understand the fundamentals of genetics and the fundamentals of computer science and, can put, and also of statistics and can put this information together to solve problems and to ask questions. Um, and if you want to read a little bit more about that and about opportunities in that area, check out this article at Wired. And next you should move on to the, the next lecture linked into this lecture series.